Most companies are not thinking about technology properly and there needed to be a new institution to bring this knowledge to entrepreneurs specifically to allow them to disrupt these industries and solve the major problems in the world. Every genius was considered an idiot the day before his idea was proven. So literally the lifespan of a company is shrinking because technology is overrunning them constantly. My name is Dermot Mee. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Singularity Group. Singularity Group is an educational organization founded at NASA Ames Research Center here in Mountain View, California. We have a mission to really have a positive impact in the world utilizing exponential technologies. We believe that we can positively impact a billion people over the next five years through these efforts. These devices are not yet inside our bodies and brains, but we're going to move in that direction. They're certainly a lot closer than they used to be. When I was a student here at MIT, we had to take my bicycle across campus to get to the one computer that MIT had that was shared by thousands of students. And this is a million times cheaper and a thousand times more powerful. That's a billion-fold increase in price performance that we've seen. Uh, so our intuition is linear. But the reality of this information technology progression is exponential. Singularity Education Group was, was founded in 2008 by Ray Kurzweil, who is a very famous futurist and works on the uh, futurist team at Google, and uh, Peter Diamandis, who's a MD, PhD researcher and serial entrepreneur. I put on the slide here the title of this talk, The Best Way to Predict the Future is Create It Yourself. That's been my philosophy in life, and it's something which I fundamentally believe. I believe that one's attitude on how you take things on is everything. And I believe that every single problem we have can be solved. Peter read Ray's book, and his book is called The Singularity is Near. And after reading that book, Peter realized that the implication of this accelerating technology means that most universities are not able to keep up. Most companies are not thinking about technology properly and there needed to be a new institution to bring this knowledge to entrepreneurs specifically to allow them to disrupt these industries and solve the major problems in the world. So Gordon Moore helped invent uh, the first microchips and he noticed the chips were becoming twice as powerful while the cost was becoming 50% less every 18 months. So this is way back, you know, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s where he was observing this pattern. If you have a product or a service and think about if that product can do twice as much for half the cost and over time that cost is falling towards zero, it's like you have a superpower. The principle that exponential change is happening and that technology is becoming more and more advanced means that things that were not possible a year ago, most people will think may not be possible for five or 10 years. But we believe with the exponential rate of change, those things will be possible faster. And so we're always trying to focus people on a bigger dream because we believe the tools will emerge faster than we expect. And that has been proven with Moore's Law over almost 100 years, demonstrating the price performance curve so that people who do not imagine that possible future also can't build it. And so we're always emphasizing the, uh, the fact that the tools will emerge. You just need the imagination and the drive and determination to use them to build the solutions of the future. I know when I was in college, we were divided into, they called us techies and fuzzies. The techies were the, the engineers and the fuzzies were the art history majors, right? And, and we, we were categorized that way. You know, we grew up in a world where initially working with technology was very limited to a few people. When I came to Singularity, I'm a history major. I worked in the nonprofit sector. I'm not a technologist. Do I belong here? What am I doing? And then one day in the classroom, the instructors told us we had to build these robots. And they were uh, Lego robot Mindstorm uh, projects, which you know lots of kids use today. But for me, I hadn't used. I remember I was working on the robot and we ran out of time. And so I, mean, I stayed up all night just trying to build this robot. And then I got the robot to work. It moved by itself and it did things. <laughs> 
And suddenly I realized I can use technology. Even though I was in my 30s, I was an adult who I'd gone through school, I'd gone through education, master's degree. I had my career set and then I changed. Every genius was considered an idiot the day before his idea was proven. So we try to encourage the entrepreneurs not to worry about profitability and cost initially and really think about the solution that they're building and the impact it will have on society. Yes, if you're 20 years too early, it may not, you may not be able to build a sustainable business. But if you're five, three, five, eight years too early, we believe the technology will come towards you. Not just the price performance, but the integration of technologies. We've proven over many, many uh, examples that the price performance curve will turn these companies into viable businesses, but it'll just take some time. Historically, technology was expensive and it was big and it would break a lot, right? So it wasn't used in the field, field of international development or humanitarian assistance. Then you have digital technologies coming along, which suddenly billions of people have access to. And then you start seeing when people have access to technology, they solve their own problems. We had a student come to Singularity in 2016, a school teacher from Myanmar. Her country, one of the poorest in the world, a broken education system. And she went home and started her country's first online education system and has 500,000 students now that are getting education through her company. It's like, she is a teacher, she knew the problem, but suddenly she had these new tools that she could use to reach hundreds of thousands of kids. So I would say the foundational program, which was our global solutions program, focused exclusively for entrepreneurs, that has led to probably 60 plus companies being founded on the principle of exponential technology and solving major problems. So that has allowed the acceleration of multiple industries. The drone industry, Matternet was one of our early companies. That group as you know a small group of entrepreneurs helped found the legal structure by which the drone industry exists in the United States today. So they were able to challenge the Department of Transportation and guide the government on how to lay out rules so that drones could actually be used commercially. And so that's a tiny company with a huge ambition for drones to be part of the economy and for to be part of delivering medicines and having that last mile transportation ability. So one of the great achievements was challenging the infrastructure and changing it in order for us to be able to pursue now what is a multi-billion dollar industry of drones and drone transportation. Another good example I think is another startup made in space which put the first two 3D printers on the International Space Station. So they envisioned a future where we will be living in space and where therefore we will have to manufacture in space. And so this was almost 10 years ago now. They convinced NASA to put 3D printers up in the International Space Station. They've done thousands of material science experiments on how we will manufacture with different materials in space. That was a massive contribution to science, but also a massive contribution to humanity's ability to live off the planet. You don't have to be an expert in it anymore. You just have to know what your desire is. And you can find that expert through this interconnected, hyper-connected world we're living in. Singularity Group was founded upon the belief that the world's biggest problems represent the world's biggest opportunities. Our mission remains unchanged, but our methods have evolved exponentially. Initially, people come to Singularity to learn, to learn about technology, to learn about social problems, to learn about exponential thinking. The challenge for corporations and business today, and if you look at the history, is that the, the tenure of a company on the S&P 500 is dropping every year. So in the 50s, companies were on there for 40, 50, 60 years. Now they're on there for eight, 10, 12 years. So literally the lifespan of a company is shrinking because technology is overrunning them constantly so that they can implement it to achieve their mission more successfully. The challenge for most leaders is that they are busy driving their business on a day-to-day -day basis. Most corporations don't look much past the next quarter, maybe the next year. And so it's very difficult for them to take the time 
to anticipate massive change or massive disruption in the future. What we do is we give them that space and time to think about and observe and learn about how fast technology is changing so that when they return to their organizations, they can tell people to pay attention. So what we do is we ask these leaders to step back for a week, really, really think about the implications, and then go back in and make radical investments inside their companies in these technologies, in the types of people that they've met at these courses. So we actually think they should hire differently. They should hire for optimistic people. They should hire for people who have a higher vision of the organization and its ability to solve problems in the future. Taking people out of the day-to-day, -day, giving them an optimistic view, giving them real, real understanding of the, of the potential of these technologies in their businesses, and then allowing them to really think deeply about the decisions they're going to make over the next few years as leaders and how those decisions will change the trajectory of their company. It'll help them anticipate disruption and hopefully survive it, but it will also help them spot opportunities where they could branch off and potentially go into other, com other industries. If you go back to you know, the creation of the, the computer even, in here in Silicon Valley, there was a big argument. You know, should computers be protected? Like the same way we protect a nuclear weapon, should only governments and universities have access to computers? And then you had in Silicon Valley this movement, put the computer on it on the kitchen table, put a computer in every house. So that debate was going on, you know, decades ago. Now, you know, we, we obviously have computers on our kitchen tables and in our pockets, right? The technology has become easier to use. So I grew up farming in Ireland. So I went to primary school, secondary school, and university in Ireland. I studied biochemistry. I did a master's in biochemistry and focused on biotechnology. And then I came to the United States and worked in the pharmaceutical and biotech industry for maybe five, eight years. My first introduction to advanced technology was being asked to help build a, a process automation lab. I basically went through the process of replicating the work of 100 scientists with robotics and computer programming. And so through that experience, I realized the massive benefits of automating these processes, allowing the scientists to go and do more research and more thoughtful research while the manual process was, was completely run by, by robots. We took 100 scientists out of the lab, replaced them with a robotic system and four technicians. Those four technicians were able to produce five times more samples than the 100 scientists. The cost saving was about maybe a million dollars a year forever. So that completely changed my perspective on the idea of implementing technology to solve problems so the humans could focus on what they're much, much better at. I then moved into work for a couple of other startups. As I left the lab, we were just entering the phase where biology was being digitized. And so we are now in a phase of what we call digital biology. So for me, the sequencing of the human genome was probably the first step in what I would call personalized medicine. So I believe in the very near future, everybody will have their genome sequenced at birth, and then over time, they will be given personalized medical and health direction so that they can live the healthiest life possible. Healthcare will change from being a disease-focused industry to being a wellness-focused industry. We believe that there's a potential to apply technology to solve climate change, to truly make energy free. And if you have free energy, then the cost of food production, the cost of everything else becomes much more manageable and it allows people to move into a, a phase of life where you can spend much more, more time on intellectual pursuits, on uh, philanthropic pursuits, where you can help people around the world live better and better qualities of life. So with the proper application of technology, we believe that the overall quality of life for everybody in the world can be improved dramatically. So I think the technological trajectory is very, very positive and we are very confident that these things can happen. I think the political, the geopolitical issues are probably limiting uh, the positive impact of a lot of technology today. And we're hoping as uh, a generation of people grow up who have a very, very deep passion for sustainability and for wellness, that that will also change the 
construct of governments and therefore policies that will allow this technology to have that impact. There is absolutely a culture of optimism in the United States. The United States was built by optimists. And so there is a, a very long tradition of believing that an individual not only has the right, but has the responsibility to build their own future. That's a unique characteristic, I think, that has been the foundation of that entrepreneurial spirit here, which has carried forward into technology. But the other thing that I have seen all over the world is that when curious people try to solve a problem that's important to them personally, that motivates entrepreneurship. Stripe was founded by two Irish guys, right? and Stripe is one of the largest payment platforms in the world. The problem they were trying to solve was they were building a video game and they couldn't find out a way to charge for it. And none of the banking systems and nothing that existed back then would allow them as two kids to charge their friends to use their system. And they said, well, maybe we can hack together some way to solve that problem. So like one of the largest, you know, you know, payment processing systems in the world was built by two kids trying to solve a problem. So my message to entrepreneurs is, Find something you're absolutely passionate about and try to solve. Try to solve that problem. Don't try to build a company. Don't try to build a, a huge empire. Solve a very specific problem. And I think you'll find that there are lots of other people with the same problem who will pay for your solution to that problem. Um, and I think that's universal all over the world. I've met entrepreneurs in every part of the world. And the ones that have been successful have been passionate about solving a problem. Try to find what motivates you personally or you're in your country, in your culture, what motivates you to solve a problem will allow anybody to build a successful business.